Alex, were you at a building on Market Street yesterday by any chance? <laughs> no fly zone. The homeless shelter? <laughs> well, uh, I think you can talk about abandoned homeless shelter. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that there will be a lot of people hmm. that we hmm. know that will go and help hmm. make Market Street better. Make Market yeah. Street great again. Make Market, make Market Street, Street, great, Street again. great again. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I'm, I'm looking forward to some tofu salads and uh, meditation. <laughs> Namaste. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I think 8,000 square feet is meditation rooms that haven't been used in five years. Quite honestly, though, like on the other side of this, I would say Parag Agrawal does deserve a statue for shareholder value creation. What Absolutely. He, what 5420 a share, which, by the way, we said was going to happen and it did happen, was ginormous in this market. And I just want to see the look on that barista's face when they're <laughs> warming up the oat milk. <laughs> <laughs> when a band <laughs> of very very tough knuckled uh company builders walks through that door yeah the oatly has left the building let's just leave it at that wow so i guess we can talk about it now uh elon has clo closed the I deal guess we can talk about it now well no I, i'm just saying sax and i could not talk about this because we had you know we, we couldn't talk about it for legal reasons they deserve a statue in front of the bronze statue for shareholder value creation <laughs> on Market Street in front of that Twitter building. Best um, tech CEO of the year, Parag <laughs> Agarwal. Hold on a second. So your theory is that he did such a bad job in terms of suppressing viewpoints and, and censorship that he actually induced Elon to want to buy the company so he could fix their censorship problem. No, my, theory, my theory is simpler <laughs> than this, which is they got great representation to do a very bulletproof deal. And it turns out that contract law still matters in the United States. And Elon did the right thing and just said, you know what, I'm going to own this thing and probably double or triple my money. So I'm just going to go and do it. And I'll do it for the benefit of everybody else. But my, my point is more that they and the board had the wherewithal to fight because, you know, that they could have easily gotten intimidated and capitulated. And in doing that, whether they were right or wrong or good or bad is irrelevant to me. They represented shareholder values well, and they got shareholders paid in a moment where the stock market is still down 20, 30, 40%, where big tech is down 50%. Some of these big tech companies are down 80%. These guys sold the company at a premium. And so that just, you know, we just have to acknowledge that that happened. That's all. Well, and yeah. to just give you a little bit of background on Twitter historically, you know, in 2013, the stock was trading at $69. And it got sold for 54. Like this company has been sideways for a decade, essentially, in terms of its market cap. And so, but it, there's no doubt that I think Elon can turn this around pretty quickly and make it massively profitable, I think, and clean up the bot problem very quickly. If you can land two rockets at a time, create self driving cars, I think you can figure this out. Uh, this isn't rocket science and Elon's done rocket science, so I think he's going to figure it out right quick. Yeah, for what it's worth, I think Elon's really excited about it. And he is excited, I think there's, yeah. There is tremendous potential at Twitter. I mean, the company's been sideways because it hasn't done that much in 10 years, but there's so much you can do with that product. It's just, you know, there's a ton of potential. I think the best way to think about it is he bought a quarter of a billion mouths for $44 billion. And in the grand scheme of things, that is, I think, going to turn out to be pretty reasonably cheap, especially if he can layer in a few of his bigger ideas. And, uh, and I think that those mouths, the value of those monthly active users could probably double or triple pretty quickly. Right. I think that was the, so I just sent you guys this link from this analyst. And he said that Twitter was bought at $172 per monthly active user compared to $81 per monthly active user at Meta, uh, where they sit today. So, well, but that's but that's for a very different point, which we can double click into because Meta is its own bag of, you know, it's a little bit of an unfortunately, you know, a bit Meta's of a dumpster got a fire. Attached to it. Well, yeah. and and I'll explain why because the the Meta, the Meta problem is it's it's a deep and a very dangerous situation that they've put themselves in, which is why their mal values are this low. But you know, if you had done this analysis a few years ago. 
the trade was looking at Meta's malvalues being so high, where you would have said, why isn't Twitter doing more? So I know that this, this is a little bit, in my opinion, cherry picking. Yeah. Well, I think making everything verified and a path to verification, which Elon has talked about publicly many times and payments, uh, you know, he's talked about publicly many times, just those two things alone, could make the experience of being on Twitter, absolutely delightful. If everybody could verify themselves, this thing could turn around so quickly. I'll say I'll say what you're saying in a slightly more I think the most powerful change that Twitter could make today is there are two classes of users people who are verified real world identity yeah and people who want to stay anonymous correct there is a hundred percent distribution fire hose for people who are real mm -hmm. and there is a fire hose for fake people or fake names that you need to pay to amplify just that one simple change will cut through all the nonsense yeah because if you want to see where the money is being spent you will be able to see very quickly because otherwise there'll be virtually no distribution for anonymous fake people. And it'll force those people if they really want to be heard, that, and that there's something valuable to say to spend against it. Well, it's, this really is about the Brigadoons. And Elon's been very clear about this, you know, it's pretty easy to get rid of the bots. And if people are opting in to putting themselves into the top class of verified users, well, that's a revenue stream, right? And so all of a sudden, you know, I don't know how think, many millions think, of people would instantly say, I'll pay for this for five or 10 bucks I think a month you're to be right. verified. I think you're right. And I think like what we want to do is like, you know, no offense to all the people out there, although I don't really care, but no offense, but you cannot use Twitter as a coping mechanism, okay? Like, I get that life is hard or that, you know, life hasn't lived out to your expectations or, you know, there's envy and whatever of other people. But to go out there and spew hate doesn't solve anything. Are you and talking so, about the Brigadoons? Well, there's also just a lot of people that are just in general. They're just they're just mean. And yeah. uh, I'll give you a perfect example. There's a woman that I saw on TikTok and she's like, uh, you know, been married for 13 years, mother of two kids. And she was, she had a thing that went viral where she was talking about who's in charge, her or her husband. And it was a very funny little thing. And so I I followed a couple of her videos just to see what else she had posted. And one of the videos was how she has some complicated health issues, which she was very public about PCOS hmm. and how it causes, you know, issues in losing weight. And she posted a pre and post picture of her, which takes a lot of courage. Hmm. And she was like Brigadoon. Hmm. And it's like, what is wrong with these broken people yeah. that have to give this woman a hard time? And it just, it to, so to me, these social media channels are not coping mechanisms. They were never meant to be. And so, you know, if they have to go to 4chan or 8chan or Reddit or whatever, better to sort of create these honeypots of hatred than to have it spew everywhere because it makes for the rest of us these platforms to be unusable. Well, Sachs, you were the COO of PayPal with Elon and Ruloff and TL and everybody and that crew over 20 years ago. Uh, and verified, you understand pretty well because you yourself have been brigadooned of late and you've, you've experienced <laughs> this firsthand, the psychological torture that made you take a week off from the show, in fact, because you were so under duress. <laughs> I'm kidding. You, t you had a planned week off. So you're allowed to have vacation. Um, which of the two ideas is the bigger idea? Payments, making Twitter into PayPal. Uh, including that x.com, which was the original name of uh, that was Elon's payment company, and he owns the domain x.com. Which is a bigger idea, the payments, or the verification, which is the bigger idea for increasing well, shareholder value, which would you do first? I mean, payments is an entire roadmap, right? So there's a lot that could be done there. Explain. Well, that. I mean, it's, it's about I mean, you could layer on a lot of services on top of that. So okay. it's not just like one feature. Look, I think they're both compelling in terms of where they could lead. I think what's amazing about Elon as an entrepreneur is he always starts with a mission and then he figures out how to turn it into a great product and a great business. So, for example, with SpaceX, the mission was to get to Mars to make life multiplanetary. You would think that'd be a spectacularly unprofitable business, but in the course of pursuing that mission, he figured out the launch business and then the satellite business was Starlink. And I think Starlink's going to be a phenomenal business phenomenal. and like and likewise with tesla he started with the mission of moving the world to sustainable energy yeah and in the process of doing that he created the world's best car not just the world's best electric car but i just think 
It's the best car in the world. And Tesla is this amazing business today. It's so far ahead of every other car company. So look, I think what's cool about what Elon is doing is he's starting with this mission of restoring Twitter to being a free speech platform of being the town square it was always meant to be. And in the process of doing that, he's going to figure out how to make Twitter into an even better product and into a great business, which is not today. I think Twitter's losing, you know, a few hundred million dollars a quarter. So there's work to do on all those fronts. But hmm. um, I think, you know, it's really impressive to see. And, you know, he's still operating at the top of his game. I mean, 20 years after PayPal, some of us are just doing a podcast, but he is, uh, he's still yeah, like, some of us are tired. Some of us are exhausted. <laughs> I know, I know. We're tired, but we're tired. And he's like working 68 hour days. He's been leveling up for 20 years. And at this point, he's like a level 99 mage or something. No, it, he's like a crazy. It's, yeah. it's amazing to, to yeah. see. Freeberg, I, the biggest issue I perceive in the short term for Twitter is going to be what to do with people like Trump and Kanye West or Ye. And of course, that's all going to seem like Elon is making those decisions as an individual as opposed to for the platform, etc. Should he let somebody like Kanye West, I'm sorry, Ye, as he likes to call himself, who was in the middle of an obvious manic episode back on the platform? Should he let Trump back on the platform? How do you think he should handle those two polarizing individuals specifically? Look, I mean, I think this is what's going to be really interesting to watch because there have been very successful, very inspirational, very intelligent, very creative entrepreneurs that have started and built generally kind of open platforms at the beginning, only to over time be challenged with the content that doesn't feel appropriate. And then they come back and they make the necessary kind of moderation guidelines and they make the necessary edits to the way the platform operates. This is how Google operated originally, you know, and then they ended up saying, you know what, if we're going to be in China, we do have to create a censored version of the internet. And they did that. And that was controversial. With YouTube, they've got a lot of censoring and it was supposed to be just a generally open platform for anyone to use. And they were even Larry and Sergey were kind of flouting DMCA at the, at the beginning. And they were like, it's not our job to monitor copyright, you have to file a takedown notice. And they kind of waved their hands in the air. Over time, they realized that that could actually damage and completely ruin the platform. And they had to go in and create guidelines and moderation systems. And um, the same was true of Ev and Jack at Twitter. Uh, the same was true of the founders at Reddit. And I don't know if you guys, you know, remember that period of time when Ellen Powell was CEO of Reddit, and she went in and cleaned up a lot of the bullying and harassment and nastiness that was going on on Reddit. And she got a lot of controversy for why are you closing it down? Why are you censoring it? Elon is a reasonable person, and he's going to be faced with unreasonable people on this platform. And when that happens, he's going to have very tough decisions to make about what kind of platform he wants to have, what's the quality of that platform going to need to look like. And then all of a sudden, he's going to have to look in the mirror and say, did I step on the wrong side? And, you know, he's, he's idealistic, and it's great, and it's wonderful, and I hope that he's successful. But to some degree, some amount of moderation is going to be necessary to create a high-quality product Would you for allow, most people. Would you, if you were in charge yourself, Freeberg, would you put Trump back on the platform? And under what circumstances? And would you allow somebody like Kanye West back on the platform? At some point? Me, obviously, me personally? He's, yeah, you personally. Yeah, trying I to get think, an answer from you personally con, con, on those look, two. Yeah, look, my content moderation guidelines, I, you know, it's a, it gets very nuanced very quick. What do you yes. allow people to say? What do you not allow them to say? And then if they violate them, is there the opportunity for a lifetime ban? I don't think so. I don't think anyone should have a lifetime ban on these platforms. Okay. So I'm totally How would you do that for Kanye that? West, who has been saying crazy anti-Semitic stuff, which has real world danger? That's already started to spill over where people are putting up banners like Kanye's right about the Jews. And they're putting up banners like over the, you know, 10 freeway, uh, as you may have seen in Los Angeles. How would you deal with Kanye specifically in a manic anti-Semitic episode that he's been Look, in? I, th I think the question is anyone that's saying anything racist or, you know, whatever might be deemed kind of uh, to fall in that category. There's a tagging mechanism, and you have to figure out how to create the tagging mechanism. Based on that tagging mechanism, the default is, it's like when you go to Google and you search for stuff, they exclude porn. So all mm -hmm. porn content that's indexed on Google's uh, index servers um, is uh, indexed as porn, and it's default off. There's yeah. a safe search thing you got to turn, um, I think, off or something to access stuff that Google deems inappropriate. Sorry, how, how, do, you, how, do, you, how do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, no, but I think, I, and by the way, I'll tell you, when I worked at Google, we used to have um, pizza weekends where you would go into the office on the weekends, they give you free pizza, 
and everyone and would porn? tag, you know, you'd watch porn and you would tag porn. And so you basically go through the indexing servers, they'd show you images and Google images, and you'd click porn or not porn. And it was just like, hey, come and volunteer, come and help us do it. And there was all these <laughs> engineers sitting in the friggin' cafeteria tagging porn. But actually, uh, you know, that this, happened to Sachs and he saw Tucker Carlson and yeah. he said, yeah, that's porn. That's, that's my, I think, I think, that's my personal way, porn. Yes. So I think, I think the same, had. Yes. <laughs> I think the same mechanism is needed on these social networks, which is that you have to figure out a way, well, you have to figure out a way to use con AI to tag content. And then Got think it. about them as cable. Just let me finish for one second. You think about them as cable, cable stations on a cable company. So they're the cable company and there's different stations. And you as a user decide what do you not want to opt into and what do you want to opt into? What content do you want to exclude from your version and your experience of Twitter? And if you're okay with the stuff Kanye says, you're okay with the stuff Trump says, you can keep that stuff in. If you want to exclude that type of content, it's, it's excluded for you. And I think that's what Twitter ultimately has to become. What do you think, Chamath? Would you put Trump back on the platform and seeing, you know, Kanye West having this manic episode and saying, you know, basically participating in hate speech explicitly? How, how, how would you handle those two specific instances in 2022 going into 2023? I think that there has to be a way where nobody is banned forever. Okay. I think that it, when somebody is banned temporarily, they can be banned for any reason that violates a term of service that's well understood and uniformly enforced. Got it. And I think that's the right of a private company. But there has to be a way to get back on. In the case of both of these folks, there should be a way to basically, you know, have because of the the step uh, the the quantity of their reach, some sort of almost like tribunal or you know mediator that can understand what's going on. Because if somebody's going through a manic episode, it's absolutely right to turn that off. I mean, these guys should have turned him off much, much sooner. Because when you're in the middle of a mania, and I, and I said this last week, like, you know, like, for example, like this, this relative of mine, when they're in a manic episode, it's 60, 70, 80 emails a day and text messages, 100 texts that I get. And they're honestly, they're vile. Yeah. Okay, and they don't even and, remember them half the time. And right? they don't like even know. Yeah. And and you know they go through paranoia, they go through mania, they go through these periods where they think they're completely right. They go through these periods where they look completely sane and normal. So, yeah. so That's a tough the, part. the yeah. most important thing when you have a family member in mental health crisis is to get the phone away from them. That is a weapon that only continues the loop and to re-regulate this person. And then there should be a way to prove that you're back in a re-regulated state to get these tools back. But I think that that needs to, we just need to acknowledge that like, there's just a lot of people with mental health issues. There's a lot of social media. There's a lot of damage that can be done. It's not to forgive these people, but it's to explain that in moments, you got to shut these channels down and then give them a way to come back when they've re-regulated. Sachs, how do you think about it? Well, with regard to Trump, I don't know what the continuing reason is for him not being allowed on the platform. Remember that when he was banned, it was considered to be a temporary measure because he was supposedly inciting a riot, right? So I think incitement to violence is legitimate grounds for taking down speech. But once that breach of the peace is over, I don't know why it would become a permanent ban as opposed to a timeout. So I don't even know how the companies continue to justify the ban on Trump, except for the fact that they just think that he's a threat to democracy. Well, I don't think that's for social networks to determine is that who gets to participate in our political process. Hmm. So it's not necessarily the first thing I would do, but do I think that Trump should be allowed back? Yeah, I do. With regard to Kanye, it's a little more complicated because like you're saying, it's hard to know whether he's having a manic episode or he's just, you know, being Kanye. What he's saying right now is probably not in his own interest and probably it would be in his best interest to have a timeout. But what I would look for guidance here is there is a, a Supreme Court decision. And my, my general view on, on the content moderation is that these social networking companies should be looking to, for inspiration to Supreme Court decisions. Because the Supreme Court's been wrestling for these with these issues for hundreds of years, whereas social networks are just making it up as they go along. And there are nine major categories of speech that the Supreme Court has said are not protected because they actually are dangerous speech. So, for example, 
in this de- decision called Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, which came out in 1942, the Supreme Court held that so-called fighting words were not protected. And they defined fighting words as speech that tends to incite an immediate breach of the peace through the use of, quote, personally abusive language that when addressed the ordinary citizen is, as a matter of common knowledge, inherently likely to provoke a violent reaction. So, you know, I would use that type of decision by the Supreme Court as inspiration to say that racist, misogynistic, homophobic, and other sort of racial racial and ethnic slurs shouldn't be allowed on these networks because it doesn't do anything to enhance the public debate. Now, there is a question, like, could Kanye frame his arguments in a way that is still incredibly offensive to us? but doesn't you use could say, slurs. Yeah, for example, he could say, hey, here are the top 10 media companies. Here are the executives. Here's the percentage that are Jewish. And this is, you know, my concern is that this is a, and here's the percentage of people who are Jewish in the population. You could some bullshit like that. And then you're like, okay, did he say something anti-Semitic? Right. You know, and, you, and you're kind of in this bubble right. area. And there's always going to be edge cases and people are always going to be pushing the envelope. And so listen, just because we find it offensive, and, you know, it's specifically offensive to me. Uh, that doesn't mean that it should automatically be banned. And, so know, I think slurs, slurs, banned or out. But but arguments, I don't know that we should be ba- banning entire categories of arguments. And, and look, part of the problem here is that lots of people are hearing the arguments that Ye is making, whether he's making them on Twitter or not. And because he's there's a total ban, people can't really engage with him on Twitter. And mm. so he's not getting off ramped from this rabbit hole he's falling into. And nobody else who might be a fan of his is hearing the other side of the argument. So yeah. I don't know that it's ultimately in the long term interest of the town square to be banning, you know, the uh, argument, the, you know, ACLU and other people have is like, hey, you put a little sunlight on these bad opinions, at least everybody knows who has the bad opinions, and you can fight them paradoxically while we're talking i mean do you really want these folks going to the dark web and you know being untraceable there is some value in kind of knowing who's getting radicalized and hopefully exposing them to other opinions in the same conversation that can off ramp them yeah i mean uh, paradoxically while we're talking uh elon just tweeted at 11 18 a.m twitter will be forming a content moderation council with widely diverse viewpoints no matter no major content decisions or account reinstatements will happen before that council convenes so he's going to take the same approach that Facebook has. They have a council as well that Zuckerberg tried to set up. So I think he realizes this should be a thoughtful uh, discussion. Sachs, are you going to be on that council? I have no idea. That sounds like a uh, the worst purgatory you could ever be in <laughs> is to be the person who has to make these decisions. Like, talk about a no-win situation. I'm curious, yeah. Chamath, we talked last week about Kanye and then Lex Friedman dropped his episode. Lex came at it with... Uh, he pushed back on Kanye. I don't know if you watched some of the highlights. I saw some of the highlights. He pushed back pretty hard. I watched the whole thing. Okay. So he pushed back really hard on the anti-Semitic stuff. And we had a discussion last week. I said, hey, you can't platform this guy. But it looks like Lex had a specific point of view, which is he has a friendship with Kanye of some level. And he wanted to try to convince him in this manicness that he's wrong about things. Did Do you think Lex succeeded and he should have done it? I, obviously, we won't question Lex's intent. We know I, it's good. I, I have had replace Lex with me and Kanye mm-hmm. with my relative. Mm-hmm. Wasn't on television or whatever, but I've had these same kinds of, I'll call them interventions. And like I said, this person goes through periods of lucidity, periods of mania, periods of paranoia, periods of anger. And so that's all I saw when I was watching this thing is just what a lot of people in the United States deal and the world deal with when they have relatives who are suffering from one of these things. And, you know, my relative has said the same thing. There's nothing wrong with me. You know, I don't need medication. I'm not on these meds, blah, blah, blah. And I don't want to judge because I don't know him. But I'll tell you in my situation, trying to like, you know, for example, like this person thinks that, you know, myself and one other person, like we hacked into a computer system of the place that they worked to manipulate the financial records to point to this person as having committed a fraud and has and then thinks that people are now listening and bugging the phone. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff over and over again. And then sometimes they don't think that and sometimes they do. And it's like, it's mad. So what I'm trying to tell you is like, 
when you're not when you're in a normal state, a regulated state, and you're talking to somebody who's dysregulated, it's not two normal people having a conversation where you're trying to get them to see the logic of your ways. So again, I just think that it's not it's not a thing that should be litigated in the media. I think it is a thing that is where people that care for this person need to surround them and get them with a doctor to help them rebalance. In 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 the in the case of our family, what it turns out is that this person needs to constantly be retitrated the drugs for them to be regulated. That may be different for other people, and I don't know yeah. Kanye's situation. So, right. anyways, I see, I see all that, and I and it, and I and I go to my own family situation, which I'm which we actively deal with today, and I don't have much of an idea of what to do about Kanye because it brings up too much stuff about what I'm dealing with in the real time with my own family. Well, I'm sorry you're going through that. And I, uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, I think Lex had good intent. I don't think it's worth doing. He no, he's, he's, somebody. he's incredible. You know, he's a really beautiful, empathetic person. Lex is in general. Yeah. So I think he tried to do the best job he could. So I saw, I saw part of the, the Lex interview. It was two and a half hours and I wasn't going to sit through two and a half hours of it, you know? Painful, I went to the yeah. I went to the chapter titles and I was in the middle is like Holocaust, Holocaust and I'm like right. and I was like okay let's just go right to the train wreck <laughs> yeah so I skipped to there but anyway I think the argument that that Lex should have made or pointed out to Kanye is like go see the the new Elvis movie which is all about how an artist basically got taken advantage of by his business manager. And you'll see that this idea is a very familiar trope in the music business. But that manager, uh, Colonel Tom Parker, he wasn't Jewish. He was a Dutch con man pretending to be a Southern hick. So this can happen, and it's a very common story, and it's got nothing to do with the uh, religion or race or whatever of the, the business people. So, And in fact, the person in that movie who has the best advice for Elvis is B.B. King who says to Elvis at a very early point in the movie, he says, if you don't do the business, the business will do you. Mm. And so, look, I think Kanye, if, again, if I was to sort of steel man and respond to it, is, listen, you know, what you're describing is a pretty common, uh, of artists being taken advantage of is, is a common issue. It goes back a long time, and it's got nothing to do with religion. And quite frankly, you know, there's probably a lot of other Jews in your life who've helped you. I mean, I wonder the last time you went... To a doctor, did you notice whether they were Jewish or not? You know, and so he's developed a little bit of a fixation here of noticing that some people are Jewish, but probably he's not noticing when other people are Jewish who probably helped him. Yeah. So that's probably like the argument I would have t made with him, you know, if I were conducting that interview. And you make the argument to a person who's in a manic episode and the, just, there's no yeah, way to reach him. They don't, nowhere, and they don't even realize what they're saying. They forget yeah. what they say when they get through the manic episode. Well, these, para right. no, these paranoias don't tend to come up when you're in a regulated normal state. Exactly. All right, let's talk about